Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this opportunity to have a conversation with Sean King about his recent book, Make Change, God. Uh, be in the midst of our talk and lead and guide us into truth. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What's the Message? I am your host, Claudia Allen, and I am here with my boss, the lady that pays my bills, the one and only uh, Carmela Monk Crawford. And we are so excited about today's episode. We are joined with none other than Sean King him. Self. He was <laughs> recently named by Time Magazine as one of the 25 most important people in the world online. He is the co-founder of Real Justice and the Action Pack. Previously, he was the senior justice writer for the New York Daily News, a senior columnist for The Intercept, and writer in residence at Harvard Law School. King served as a pastor, teacher, and motivational speaker in Atlanta's juvenile justice system. In 2019, he launched the media platform, The North Star, as well as the popular news podcast, The Breakdown. And he lives in Brooklyn, New York, with his wife and five kids listen i am so excited to have you to talk about your most recent book make change shameless plug all right, all right. <laughs> thank you go ahead you. and get this fantastic read um man just Carmela, what were your initial thoughts you know you listened to the audiobook i read the hardcover Let's mm -hmm. let let's talk about this thing. And I have a hundred million questions to ask Sean. I love it. And I love to see all of your post-it notes there in your book. That that <laughs> lets me know. Like some people, some people hold the book up, but I'm like, I don't I don't know if you read that or not. <laughs> and, you can't uh, even crack the book, right? Yeah. Listen, yeah, right. listen post-it notes and pen, it's sitting right here with me. Yo. Yeah. I was doing it's the same smoke. thing with the audiobook. Yeah. I was just telling Sean King, I don't even know what to call you right now. We're just excited. I was telling that I was you were in my ears for the last three days. And one thing that um, I know you used to um, work as a pastor. And yeah. the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, that at all the end of the service, everybody's coming out and they're like, pastor, that was for me. That's oh. how I felt as <laughs> oh, I read so this, listened to this book, man, pastor, that was a word for me. Oh, and I, I think the, uh, the thing that really uh, struck me first was your ability to put your finger on the zeitgeist mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. social justice community. Yeah. Well, you why, know, don't you, why don't you unpack that? What is that feeling right now? Mm -hmm. Well, well, two things. You know, first, every, every day before I would write, I would always pray. And mm. I, would, I would pray just like we prayed before our time together today. I would pray for God to give me clarity. Sometimes I would have so much on my mind and so much on my heart that it would be hard to focus and concentrate. And some, some days I would need to write for eight hours or 10 hours a day. And, and there would be so much coming at me from so many angles. And I would say, God, man, please give me focus and clarity. Mm -hmm. I would ask God, to, you know, you know, give me, give me the words that would speak to the, the listener or the reader and and a, a lot of what helped give me clarity, Carmela, is is something really hard 
is I learned from a whole lot of failure. And mm -hmm. part of why I think I'm able to see how change is made is because I tried in a hundred different ways and, and probably failed on 97 of those ways. And it just gave me clarity on what works, what doesn't, why does it work? Why doesn't it work? And so I've spent, you know, I say in the book, actually, when I, when we published the book, I had traveled to 45 states. I've now traveled to 47 states, Mercy. teaching, leading, organizing, learning, listening, and all of that kind of just helped me give readers a deep insight into where we are as a country, how we got here as a country, and how we can unravel some of the mess that we find ourselves in and, and what that will look and feel like. And um, what I found was as I traveled all over the country, and this is why, why I wrote the book, everywhere I went, people would ask me one question. It didn't matter. I traveled as far north as Alaska. I traveled all over the, the deep south in the Mississippi Delta. I traveled as far west as Hawaii and every state in between. Everywhere I went, it didn't matter if, if it was a group of, of believers. It didn't matter if I was speaking to um, a group of, of Muslim clerics. It didn't matter if I was speaking at a, at a college or a university. People would ask this one question in some way. They would say, Sean... I'm frustrated about injustice. They might name the injustice, but I just don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do in my life to impact this issue. And they would tell me, they were like, listen, Sean, I've filled out petitions. Sean, mm -hmm. I've, even, I've even gone to a march or a demonstration, but I just feel like there's a lot more I should be doing. Sean, please tell me what to do. And I would always try to answer that. And sometimes I'd only have a minute Sometimes it would be an email and I only could fire off a few sentences. Mm -hmm. And eventually I just said, listen, I, I was asked that question thousands of times. I need to stop and write it. And, and it took me nearly a year to do the research and writing and editing for it. And, and so instead of a, a cut and paste answer for one person that might not work for the next, I tried to give the most comprehensive answer to that question that I could. Here is how you can use your life to actually impact the issues that bother us in the world. And so as much as I wrote it, uh, Carmela and Claudia, you know, to be I want I want the book to be interesting. I want it to be readable, but I wrote it for people to live it. And mm. um, it's not an autobiography. It, it is autobiographical in places, but I really wrote it as kind of a manifesto of here is how we can change the world together. And, uh, and my hope is that people will take it and use it in their own lives. Man, you know, I, I, I definitely felt that as I was reading one of the first questions that came to my mind that I really wanted to ask you was, um, was there a particular person? Did you see a body in mind uh, when you were writing? Because I felt like, you know, I'm an English major and yeah. a little bit of a writer myself. And so the language that you used was just so masterful that I was like, man, uh, I want to know who he's writing to, because this <laughs> is not just ambiguous, vague conversation or ideas. Yeah. This is, I can see somebody in my mind mm. as I'm putting words to page. I have, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. And I do normally have three or four people in mind when I'm writing. And, you know, I've written thousands of articles. I was the senior justice writer at the New York Daily News for several years. And even when I was writing those articles, I had two or three kind of composite characters in mind. First, uh, I have my mother in mind. My mother reads a lot of what I write. My mother, my mother didn't go to college, doesn't have, doesn't have an advanced degree. My mother, uh, like I never wanted, I never wanted my mother to read something that I wrote and be confused by it. And mm -hmm. so I wanted, I wanted to be able to still unpack complicated issues and ideas for her that she still mm -hmm. understood without having to follow up and say, you said something and I don't quite know what you mean. So I had my mother in mind. When I would travel across the country, I started being really surprised by people who would tell me that elementary school students, middle school students, high school students were listening to my podcast, 
sometimes they would listen to my podcast in class. Uh, their teacher would play it for them. Mm. And I realized it's like, ah, there are kids listening mm. who may not have all of the information that we have. And I need to be able to unpack lessons in a way that no matter how old you are, that you understand it. Now, here's the third person that kind of throws a wrench in all of that. So I'm, I'm writing this for my mother. I'm writing this knowing that young children are, are, are reading. But a lot of, a lot of professors and policymakers mm. read what I write and listen to the podcast as well. So I have to have something that's as, as sophisticated enough and, and groundbreaking enough to where a policymaker or an expert or an educator still reads this and feels like, ah, I never thought of that before. I never considered that. And so my struggle is to say something that a young person or senior citizen who may not be trained in all the, all the ideas that we have, that they get it, but that it still engages an intellectual community in a way that they still get something from it. And so that's a struggle. And so I'm always walking on that tightrope of trying to speak very plainly, but still share complicated lessons that make people have light bulb moments, if you will. Mm -hmm. Wow, no, that's amazing. Yeah. Carmela, right before you ask your question, mm -hmm. guys, uh, this is uh, already off to a really great start. And we see so many of you are already in the comments chiming in. Mm -hmm. um, make sure to click that share button um, so that more people can get access to this conversation and uh, hear Sean King talk about what it means to really make change. Carmela? Yeah. Change. I, you know, early on in the book, you talk about your experience of um, seeing the viral video, what is now obviously a viral video of um, Eric Garner. Yeah. And what's so sad is that there are so many viral videos in mm -hmm. which we are watching people die now. Yeah. And so I guess I, I kind of have two different questions. Sure. One, how are we to come and make, what do we make of the trauma mm. that we are witness to that seems to seep so deeply into our spirits after yeah. doing this? And what is your thought on sharing these? I mean, you being yeah. who you are, yeah. if it were not for social media, we wouldn't know this. But, you know, where where are you on that right now? I have, yeah, I have I have thoughts about both of those questions. You know, I, I tell the story of where I was. I, my family and I had moved. We lived in Atlanta for almost 20 years and we moved to Southern California. And uh, six years ago in July of 2014, I was, I was at my cubicle. I was the director of communications for this national environmental charity. And a buddy of mine who, who I, who never, never sent me Facebook messages. And I rarely even checked my Facebook messages. Mm -hmm. On this morning, I got to the office super early and a guy that I went to Morehouse with sent me this video of Eric Garner being murdered and it had not gone viral. And we didn't even know his name. We just, we, we described him as the man in the video. And it was the first time in my life so much has changed in the past six years. Yeah. It was the first time in my life I had ever seen a man die in real life. I'd seen it in the movies, of course. This was the first viral video of somebody being killed by police. And I was, I was, I was wrecked by it. I mean, it, 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 it impacted me so deeply that I, I felt like I had just witnessed a lynching. And in effect, that's what happened to Eric Garner. Mm -hmm. they, they lynched this man. And it was the last day I ever worked for Global Green. I, I, I give them a shout out in the book because they paid me for about another month. <laughs> but I never, yeah. but I never, and they, they needed to let me go. But they also saw that I was, because in the following month, Michael Brown was murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a man named John Crawford, who was a young father in Ohio, was murdered. Uh, a young brother in Los Angeles named Ezel Ford was murdered. And all of a sudden we came to understand through social media, through cell phone technology, we came to understand that what we thought was American police killing people every two to three weeks, we came to understand that they were actually killing three to four people a day, every single day 
and nobody had just tracked with it. And that crisis took over the country. And I have now studied probably about 500 videos of people being killed by police and which is, which is awful. I'm not desensitized to them because it's normally family members who send them to me saying, Sean, this is my father. This is my uncle. This was my brother. This was my son. This was my mother, my daughter, my sister. And I, I, Sean, I don't know if you can help, but I need you. We need your help. And normally families are asking me Mm -hmm. and Carmela, this is, I have a a process on whether or not I share any of these videos. First, just to be clear, I hate the videos Mm -hmm. less than I hate the videos. I hate that the injustice on the videos exists in the first place. It's not the video. That's the problem as much as it is the injustice, but almost every video I've ever shared And out of the 500 or so that I've studied, I've probably shared 20% of those. Mm -hmm. Families have asked me, Sean, we we can't get any movement on this case. The, the, The police won't meet with us. The district attorneys won't meet with us. Please share this video. And and yet I know, I know instinctively, Carmela, that when I share it, that it does cause trauma. And so I have to balance this real struggle of a family saying, Sean, we've already shared the video. Just recently, I shared a video of a brother killed in a Pennsylvania jail named Shaheen Mackey. Mm -hmm. And his family had been sharing the video and and, nobody followed them. Nobody knew. And so his family said, please, we need the world to see what they did to our brother. And, um, And yet I know when I share that video that while I'm honoring this family's request, that it then causes a a level of despair and trauma for everybody who sees it. And uh, I struggle with that. And uh, I don't I don't necessarily have peace with it. I'm disgusted that it takes me sharing a horrible murder video Mm -hmm. to sometimes get a family, a meeting with the district attorney or for a family to be taken seriously. And yet sometimes that's exactly what it takes until we got the video of Ahmaud Aubrey being killed until we shared it. uh, They had no plan on arresting those men. Mm -hmm. And it was us sharing this. I share, I was one of the first people to receive and share the video of George Floyd being murdered. Mm -hmm. And we know that that video had Mm -hmm. so much to do with those officers being arrested. Uh, Had there not been a video and had it not been shared, I don't even know if we would know George Floyd's name. In fact, three other black men were killed by police that same day. Right. And but there were no videos of any of those. And so who knows what really happened there? So it's a struggle. I I struggle with it. People hate it. People. I get a lot of criticism for sharing the videos, but people don't know on the back end that I'm working with attorneys, I'm working with families, and we're trying to pursue justice. But at the same time, I, I accept the criticism. The videos cause harm. Yeah. Well, I want to say it, this it right here. Uh, there definitely is no criticism coming from me. I asked the question, I think is interesting because our cover story for our current issue carries a story called, I Saw a Man Die. Mm. And the writer of that story learned of Ahmaud Aubrey's death and he cites you. He saw it. He saw it from you. So you are both the first responder and the credible witness, um, whereas other news outlets may not pick this up. Well, you know, Ahmaud's mother, Wanda, is on the board of our organization. And when Lee Merritt, the attorney for for Ahmaud's family, when Lee and I got this video, we cried. I mean, like we literally cried like babies. And it makes me emotional even thinking about it because we had imagined in our minds what we, and we tried to even retrace the steps. And we thought we understood what happened to Ahmad, but it was even worse than we imagined. Mm. And, and we, you know, we asked each other who it would be best to share it. We talked with his mother. And uh, his mother was kind of like 
the mother of Emmett Till, who mm. said, no, no, share the video of what they did to my son. Mm. And, um, and, um, and so when we shared it, there was a lot of criticism. And, and yet our primary responsibility uh, for me and Lee is to Ahmad's family. Mm. Mm. But it does, it's not, it, it, it does cause harm. It does cause trauma. And we don't, I don't feel good about that. And uh, every, every day when I do this work, I have to balance those things out. And, and um, Lee and I both are, are believers and, pr- and pray with one another. And, you know, Lee and I see, you know, we see the story of Jesus as somebody who was literally publicly executed by the government. And so Jesus is not some distant, irrelevant figure to us, but was literally arrested and murdered. And Mm -hmm. and so we see we see parallels to the to the oppression that Jesus experienced to uh, the people that we're fighting for. And we feel like the work we do. Uh, we don't say it, we don't get a chance to say it publicly, but we both very much feel like it's our ministry and, uh, and we're, we're guiding families through their hardest moments. And, uh, it comes with a lot of, comes with a lot of criticism, but we feel like we're faithful to those families every day. Man. So I had that experience, I'd say twice when I saw the when Jet did a, an anniversary cover of Emmett Till, mm-hmm. I was about, I think, 13 or 14 yeah. mm-hmm. and saw that cover at, the, at my house for the first time yeah. and was very much so like, it's awful. Who is this and what happened? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, terrible. And, and learned of that story. And then I had the same kind of gut visceral reaction in 2014 when I saw Mike Brown die. Yeah. And I think the thing that got me the most about Mike Brown was him laying out in the concrete for four hours, yeah. just like uncovered, um, actively dead yeah. to all that surrounding apartment complex and nobody, no public servant yeah. thought it even uh valid enough to cover him well you know i was i spoke to michael's father this weekend it was the sixth anniversary of of michael's murder yeah and um you know michael's family was there they were there he had aunts uncles cousins grandparents his mother there's a video that i shared that day of a woman that was screaming i didn't know who the woman was that was his mother and and his family is there like these were friends these were this community this was th- this this community knew him well and loved him he mm-hmm. he had just graduated from summer school the week before he was a boy he was a teenage yeah. boy who had just finished summer school for high school mm-hmm. the, the previous weekend he was the best man at his father's wedding Mm-hmm. And he was literally, it was early August and he was a teenage boy dreaming and thinking about what was next in his life. And that community on Canfield Drive where he was murdered, they knew him and and people were people were not only offended that they left him there like that, they were just crushed because yeah. they, and what we didn't know was that police had been brutal most of us had never heard of Ferguson before Right. that police had been brutal there for years on end. And this was in a lot of ways, the straw that broke the camel's back for people in St. Louis and Ferguson. And, uh, and it, it, it ignited something in them. And Ferguson has really been the heart of this movement for, for, for many years. We want to hear from you guys. Who was, share with us the name. Who was Mm. the person that uh, you first saw Mm. uh, murdered? I was trying to find a nicer word. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, 
what was the name of the person that you first saw murdered uh, either on television, in a magazine, or right here on social media? Sean, you say in your book, at my heart, I am an imaginative futurist, Mm -hmm. and I absolutely believe we have the power to build and own what our future becomes. Mm -hmm. In spite of everything that we just talked about and how heavy that is, how are you still able to be what you call an imaginative futurist? Mm -hmm. Well, it requires, this country is exhausting. First off, like just let's begin there. And, right. and, and this country has a way of squeezing all hope, all imagination out of you. And mm-hmm. I have always been, you know, like to borrow a Disney word, like I've always tried to be an imagineer in my own in my mm-hmm. own way. Like uh, I see myself, even though I'm seen as an activist and an organizer, I see myself as a creative and I'm always trying to dream of what a what a better future would look like for us. What does, you know, it's some of, I you know, I have behind me and it's, it's kind of overused, but the beauty of even the film Black Panther and the beauty of Wakanda, it had black writers, black producers, was it was the first mainstream telling of an imaginative black future of, what would happen if we created our own systems, structures, technologies, things like that? And that's part of what what electrified us for it. But I try to do that on issues of justice, on on issues of organizing. Like, I don't want to be bound by what we've done before. Mm-hmm. And what I know is to get wherever it is we want to go, it will require us to not just use constructs that we've seen before, but it will require us to really tap into to our own dreams and hopes and aspirations and imagination to to define something beautiful that's possible. That's not easy. Uh, no, it uh, it requires from, for me, it does require faith. It requires um, it requires me also to to sometimes disconnect myself from the horrors of all the things that we talked about to say, how could they do what they did to Breonna Taylor and us still think that this country could be better. And some of it is my training is as a historian, my, my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in history. And what I've seen throughout history is that even when society can get really, really low and what I've learned is that societies can get lower than you could ever imagine. The transatlantic slave trade, the Holocaust, Rwandan genocide, however low you think society can get, it can go lower and lower. What I've seen is in all of those examples, I've seen societies climb back and Mm -hmm. communities and cultures rebound from horrible atrocities. And I think we're in, I don't want to compare our moment to other historical low moments, but we're somewhere in that low spectrum of humanity. And I just believe that we can also rebound like we've seen other, other communities and cultures rebound. We can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think your work with the real justice pack, I think to me, that's sort of imaginative because the approach um, in terms of seeking to put uh, compassionate district attorneys in office as a person I used to work as a as a defender. You know, that's why I'm looking at your your trajectory and the the different things that you've done in your life. I, 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 I track that closely because there are so many of my interests that That's are, it. you know, the, the yeah. things that you've been involved with. But as a defender, you know, we grew up thinking, you know, we need somebody to come in like Johnny Cochran or somebody like uh-huh. Ben Crump to come yeah. in and defend. And that's just true. And Lee Merritt, we need uh-huh. these people to be in the courtroom. We also need those prosecutors that are not going to overcharge. And well, the people well, what, who are we, not what gonna... we decided to do mm-hmm. was we decided to imagine, well, what happens if you put someone like Ben Crump in charge of the system? Right. Um, that was our imagination was to say, OK, yes, we need we need Ben Crump's and Lee Merritt's and Johnny Cochran's and others to defend people. Mm-hmm. But let's imagine what would happen 
if instead of having them just defend people, what if we put them in charge of the whole system? Mm -hmm. And what we've done is now elect public defenders and civil rights attorneys as the lead district attorneys and prosecutors. And they have come in there. We've now elected 20 different district attorneys all over the country from from Boston to San Francisco to St. Louis to deep in Jackson, Mississippi, to, to San Antonio and, and many other cities. And they have radically changed the justice system. Um, I didn't get a chance to say it because it hadn't happened yet. I talk about electing Chase Boudin as the new district attorney of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Chase has said something when he was elected that I thought I didn't think it was ridiculous, but I thought it would take him one or two terms to do it. He said he wanted to cut the jail population in San Francisco by 50 percent. And I thought it would take him four years or eight years to do it. He's been in office for eight months and has already cut it by 50 percent. And he did in eight months what I thought would take him eight years. And wow. and it just shows like, yeah, if you. If you can imagine a different way to do it, it can mm -hmm. actually happen that way. And the work we've done at Real Justice has probably been some of the work I'm most proud of. Um, you know, it's impacted tens of thousands of lives. Can you That's explain a little more? I'm sorry, before you go on, yep. Claudia, can you, can you explain a little more the strategy and the ideas of what you're doing? You're, you're, you're just talking about um, creating but if you could unpack that a little bit yeah, I'd well, like to hear about what it is that you want to do and you want to see well well I'll tell you how we arrived at that and because I think it's relevant for everybody who's watching and listening we fought for justice for for Michael Brown for Tamir Rice who a 12 year old boy who was brutally murdered in Cleveland we fought for justice for Eric Garner for Alton Sterling for Philando Castile for Sandra Bland, for Freddie Gray, and not a single one of those families got justice. None of them, zero. And, and it wasn't because we didn't march enough. We People marched. It wasn't because they weren't hashtags and trending topics. These were the number one trending names in the world, not just in our communities, not just in, in a niche place. These were the cover stories of every newspaper in our country, and we still got no justice. And it then required us to go, Carmela, to that imaginative place to say, how do we change the equation here? And what we realized is we were demanding justice from people who would never give it to us. They had no intention. They didn't respect us. In some ways, we didn't vote for them. We didn't donate to them. They didn't know us. Yeah. They didn't come from our communities. They didn't love or care about our communities. So out of that came this idea of our organization, Real Justice, that mm -hmm. we need to put people in power who are accountable to us, who love us and value us, who are willing to see the world and see the justice system in a very different way. And you can approach any problem that way. In some ways, you have to reverse engineer a problem and start at what you want that thing to look like and figure out how do we get there? Mm -hmm. and, and what I talk about in the book, Claudia, is that a lot of the things that we do, and this is, this is a painful thing for me to say, a lot of the things that we do build real awareness and awareness mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all it does is it, is it just builds awareness, but it doesn't necessarily lead to action. And sometimes there's this huge gap between the awareness we build and the change we want. And wow. I try to answer in the book what's between that gap, because right now we have international awareness of what happened to Breonna Taylor, yes. but we don't have the action. And how do we how do we build that gap to have it? And um, and some of the answers that I provide are not necessarily what people would expect. It's change is change is hard systems are hard to change and uh mm -hmm. but we have to we have to be taking the right steps to make change like it, change will never happen accidentally uh i mean it always requires a strategy it requires uh, like a, a sophisticated plan that's mm -hmm. as complicated as the problem itself yeah. and sometimes 
sometimes the problem overwhelms our plans. Mm -hmm. And and what I want to say to people, and I, I I said a version of this in uh, I won't name I won't name the city, but <laughs> I I said this in a major American city, mm -hmm. and uh, and started getting heckled by the crowd. And what I said is that sometimes our plans it is hurtful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our plans are not are not good enough. Sometimes they're not robust enough. Sometimes they're not strategic enough. Sometimes, sometimes we have all the energy we need, mm -hmm. but you could write the plan on the back of a napkin. And if your plan doesn't meet the moment, the moment, it, the moment will bulldoze right over your plan. And, wow. and what I'm trying to do there is not critique us, I'm yeah. trying to give us agency to mm -hmm. say, listen, we can succeed more if mm -hmm. if we spend time in strategic ways to respond to our worst problems in some ways that may actually work. It's not a criticism. Yeah. It's to say that we have to pivot sometimes to do what we know could actually work. I think that was one of the most powerful yet overwhelming aspects of the book in <laughs> when you were breaking down the amount of work, labor, um, thought, yeah. time that really goes into organizing, really shifting from awareness and really what I kind of saw in here as well is there's a shift from awareness to charity to yeah. justice yeah. and it's like all three of these things are very different all three of these things are very necessary mm -hmm. but they are separate entities and yeah. too many times we try to argue that well i'm just gonna do awareness and awareness equals justice or i'm just gonna do charity and charity equals justice whereas what i what i felt like i read you saying was no justice is justice <laughs> and yeah, we yeah. need awareness and we need charity, but we have to be willing to celebrate the wins, yeah, celebrate yeah, yeah, what yeah. we have done effectively, celebrate, you know, the demonstration, celebrate the work, but be willing to be honest with ourselves and mm -hmm. hold ourselves accountable and say, there's more, there's space for growth. There's space for, way more intentional, strategic engagement. And I think that that's something that we haven't really heard from, you know, our activists, our leaders to be able to honestly say, not everybody can say I've written 1500 articles, Sean. Like not everybody can say like I have, I have lobbied and talked with politicians or I have worked to get DAs in office. I have mm -hmm. done all of these things. And that individual to still say there's more really well, causes you to, to, to think. Well, about, part of it, you know, in the book, in some ways, I am even critiquing my own life to say, that a lot of what I did, and I'm not saying it's wrong, mm -hmm. but that a lot of what I have done over the course of my life built awareness of our problems, mm -hmm. but it didn't actually change them. And, and it just took me years of building all the, I thought, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, was a, it was a painful realization. I thought that if people in power were aware of our greatest problems, yeah. that they would make the change. And the lesson that I learned is, no, they are fully willing to be completely aware of our worst problems and do nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And that awareness can create the climate for change, mm -hmm. but it's not change itself. And, and in fact, awareness is, is far removed from the change now, you don't have change without the awareness. It builds the momentum. Mm -hmm. It builds the energy. It builds it, it. It begins to build structure. But a lot of times we focus 95 percent of our effort on the awareness. Mm -hmm. And then we just have this little five percent of us left. And I'm saying we need a, we need more balance 
between awareness and the systems building, the, the plan creation. And then even one of the lessons I try to share is that a plan is really only as effective as the ability of everyday people to repeat that thing back to you. Mm-hmm. And if you have a wonderful plan, but nobody knows it, then, then it's not effective. I mean, mm-hmm. people have to say, here is the plan and here's where we're moving. Mm-hmm. Now that, that sounds discouraging, but I hear, I, I even hear that and I'm encouraged because what that means is we haven't done our best work. Yeah. It means that I would be discouraged if I thought we had all done the very best we could possibly do and mm-hmm. then nothing changed. What I'm saying is I think we're only scratching the surface of what we can do. And, we and can do. yeah, and we can do so much more. That's right. Now I'm going to ask you something. Okay. So there's two things in what you're saying and you in the book, and we're not asking you to give away the whole book or anything like that. Oh, I'll yeah, talk about book, all of it. Yeah. The yeah. book is rich. Everybody is, is rich and, 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 and it does give you a sense. Well, yeah, I can do this, mm-hmm. but there's two things. One, you, you talk about, this is a judgment free zone because I'm, you know, I sense even within your personal story and the trials and the, 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 the struggles that you've gone through, there's like a subtext of, I wish I had known this more, or I wish I was more aware, or I yeah. wish I was more prepared. Even as people were, um, mistreating is not the word here. Even as people were brutalizing you, you know, you sense like, how did I get into this? And so there's a serious, mm-hmm desire to be more strategic and effectual. My question to you, and I know I'm all over the place. That's what happens when you- No, no, I'm with you. I'm tracking with you. Your head is filled (laughs) with so many good stories. But my my question to you is, um, can you give us one of your shrewdest observations at success on the social justice level? Yeah. that people can get because I know what I'm thinking about in my mind, but I would love to hear what you're thinking. Well, I um, I've been I've been speaking on a, like I'm doing an online speaking tour every night. And the what I've enjoyed about it is it's getting it's it's giving me an opportunity to kind of break down some of the more complicated truths of the book. And I think if I if I had to say one thing that is just required of you to be able to actually be effective. It's going to sound super simple, but people are underestimating what it means. I don't think most people have actually made a firm, clear decision on what it is they want to change in the world. Mm. And I think people are bothered by a lot of stuff. Mm. And I don't, I don't mean that facetiously, I think people are heartbroken. I think they're disturbed. I think people are angry and frustrated, but that's not a decision. I'm saying, what is the problem in the world that you have said? I'm I'm going to fight for this thing until I see the change. If it takes a week, if it takes a month, if it takes the rest of my life, I'm not letting go. I'm going to fight for it until I see a change. And here's and here's where I push back on people. People will then sometimes in the comments say, well, here's their decision and here's the decision they've made. And Mm -hmm. and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But what I say in the book is the greatest evidence that you have actually made that decision is not you telling me that you've made it. It's if I went to your friends and family and said, "Uh, what is Claudia's cause? Mm -hmm. And if and if Claudia's friends and family don't know what it is, then Claudia hasn't actually made that decision. Because when you've made that decision, everybody around you will know it. You're you you're ask you're trying to recruit them to the cause. You talk about it every single day. Your neighbors will probably know. Your coworkers and colleagues will know. When you've actually decided to dedicate your life to a cause, and Claudia, I'm not saying you haven't made a decision. No, I'm saying when I'm saying when any of us make a decision, the evidence is not you telling me you made it. The mm-hmm. evidence, the proof is everybody around you will know it. And and I try to live that there's not a person who knows me 
who, if you ask them, and it's not just because I'm well known, it's because of decisions I make every day. If you ask anybody in my universe, including the two of you, what is it that Sean fights for regularly? Mm -hmm. You can come up with an answer because I won't let go of it. I won't yeah. stop. And and what I have found is there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of anger, but not enough people making binding decisions like I'm going to fight until I change this thing. And it yeah. requires the problems we're up against require that type of decision. Man, mm. that's that's so good. There's like so much going through my mind and I only have like so much time and I have so many questions. I appreciate but... you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry that we can't stay even longer. I've enjoyed the time. I looked at the time and it has flown by. Yeah, uh, it is gone. You but... asked a question because I got to ask him. Uh, we did a couple too. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'll try to be shorter and let's try to do some rapid, uh, some rapid Ra fire. Yeah. Rapid round. fire. <laughs> Listen, one of I got to read another section, man. This is okay. a really good one. Um, you said the systems and structures of oppression and the people who oversee and guide them are fully willing to wait out the organized masses. They are content to watch our marches and protests from the windows of their offices or on their screens without ever yielding to a single one of our demands. They will stall us and do everything they can to slow our momentum to a snail's pace in the hope that doing so will mean that we will lose steam and give up, keeping the status quo fully intact. They are banking on mm -hmm. our collective wave of energy simply being a blip on the radar, something that they can steamroll over or count on dying out over time. Yeah, yeah. The writer in me is in love, guys. I need ah. you to get the book, okay? Get yeah. the book. But one of the it's questions painful, that I'm seeing- Painful, painful, yeah. Painful. One of the questions I'm, I, I'm seeing that I could put all into one good question that, that's within our comments right now how do you effectively get volunteers engaged in a plan, uh, in an organized idea yeah. um, so that you can effectively make change? It's like they've got the energy, they've got the knowledge, they're with you. How do you really mobilize the people that you have? I, I would say two or three things quickly, Claudia. I would say first, everybody doesn't have to create the plan. And it may be it may be a team of three or four people. So say there are 100 people who I always want people marching and demonstrating. My my heroes right now are a, a group called Until Freedom, led by Tamika Mallory, and they are on the front lines. Mm -hmm. But Tamika has an understanding that while they're on the front lines, there are people like me and others who are doing the behind the scenes strategy. So we have an understanding that while they're on the front, there are other people working behind the scenes. And that's important. Everybody doesn't have to write the strategy. Everybody doesn't have to be on the front lines of the protests. So sometimes you need to have a group of people who break away, who are strategists and, and creatives and thinkers, and they have to be able to translate that plan to, to the whole group, but everybody doesn't have to create it. I will say also that, and this is important, moments pass that that section that you just read, Claudia, is about how there are moments in time that happen. Mm -hmm. And when those moments happen, you have to organize and push quickly because that moment will leave. And what people in power are, are, are banking on is that you won't organize well enough in that window of opportunity. And so when there when there is national momentum and national energy, you have to rush into that, not just on mass incarceration or police brutality. It might be on climate change. It might be on school shootings. It could be on many things. Yeah. But there are these windows and I need people to understand that those windows of opportunity, they come and they go and you can't artificially recreate them when there is a moment in our nation where our, where our energy and focus is on an issue, you have to really move quickly and efficiently during that window. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we slow ourselves down too much. Also, you don't need to, I want plans to be smart, but sometimes we overthink and over edit 
Sometimes you just have to put the plan in place. You can refine it. It can literally be a Google Doc that's a living document that you improve regularly. But we just get stuck. You know, we talk ourselves out of more change making than anybody else talks us out of. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that there aren't people in the world who discourage you from doing good. That, that happens. Mm -hmm. But we talk ourselves out of doing good in the world way more than anybody else talks us out of it. Yeah. It's about just saying like, I'm gonna do this. And yeah. it doesn't mean you're a guru. It doesn't mean you're an expert, but it takes, it takes heart more than it takes experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was my question. I got two questions. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the heart, you make me think about this, you know, because when I think about your causes and I know we, we all do, you know, uh, mass incarceration and police brutality. And I think about your life and your story. And part of me wonders, you know, why can't we get to the heart of people? You know what I mean? That That's the thing. Sometimes I wonder if, uh, you know, are you surprised at the depths of or the uh, the entrenchment of people who are holding on to these racist ideas? And why can't we get to that? What is the key to bridging what my perspective is to someone else who doesn't even see it like that? Mm. Well, there, I have I have good news and bad news. And <laughs> uh, you do. The, I'll, I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that social media and and I talk a lot about the 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 painful side of social media throughout the book. Social media causes us to be more deeply entrenched in our own buckets and silos and divisions. And, and what it does is it kind of creates a feedback loop of whatever, say you have a problematic view about the world. Mm. There is a community online that will reinforce that over and over and over again and give you the impression that your view is not problematic, but that everybody else is problematic for thinking that yours is. And so what's happened, like Donald Trump in a lot of ways is the president that social media created. He, yeah. uh, I don't think you have I don't even say this as a critique of his presidency, just as a historian, I don't think he's elected if there's no Twitter, if there's no Facebook. He emerged out of this small but devoted group of people who loved him on social media. So I'm worried that social media makes our divisions worse in a lot of ways. Now, here's the good news. Over the past three months, a lot of polls and studies have shown that more people now identify with the Black Lives Matter movement. More people believe that systemic racism is real than at any point in measured American history. Now, that's encouraging because what it means is that the awareness is building momentum. It also means that people are reading not just my books, but a dozen other really essential texts. People are becoming more informed. And my hope is that we can keep that momentum. But even then, like being informed is not enough. And so, for instance, uh, Sean Hannity um, said that on the day after George Floyd was murdered, uh, he said he was I mean, he said it was horrible. And as as much as I loathe him and think he's super problematic, there was this one day where he looked at it and was like, yeah, that should not have happened. Mm -hmm. And yet a few days later, he was speaking out against protesters and organizers and demonstrators. So like I was encouraged that there was this window where somebody who rarely speaks out against injustice saw it and acknowledged it. But again, those windows, they close so quickly, you know. Mm hmm. Man, we only have a few minutes. And so what I would love is very quickly Kamala Harris is the Democratic uh, vice president nominee. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yep. Is the is the Biden Democrat ticket? Is that going to make some change that that we see that we believe in that we want? And then as you close, um, we like to say that, you know, on here, we like to find the hope in the headlines. So yeah. 
for oh, you, what in. is the hope in all of this? And then please feel free to promote the book, share how people can get the book, as well as how they can either partner with some of your organizations yeah. on yeah, the ground yeah. and volunteer. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll start there just to say, uh, you know, the book Make Change is available everywhere. Yeah. The only the only caveat that I want to say is that I would love it if people bought it from independent bookstores, black owned bookstores. If you go to makechangebook.com, we have a lot of those listed, but you can get it everywhere books are sold. The audio book is on Audible and I think people will love it. Um, People were surprised and I, I actually trended on Twitter for like a day because I said something encouraging about Kamala Harris Right. I had been a I've been a huge critic of hers. And so there are all types of tweets of mine where I had been overtly critical of her record on mass incarceration and policing. And most of those tweets I wrote in 2016, 2017, 2018. But I have seen her evolve. And let, let me just say, I don't work for her. I've never been paid by a politician a day in my life. I don't work for the Democratic Party. I'm a huge critic of the Democratic Party. But I have watched her grow and evolve in real, substantive, measurable, tangible ways on mm -hmm. policies, on reform, on, for instance, as as a prosecutor, she prosecuted thousands of people for possession of marijuana. She has now said she wished she hadn't and that she is for the decriminalization and legalization. She is for expunging people's records. That's progress. Mm -hmm. She has said this summer that she is for the she is for ending qualified immunity so that people can pro uh, properly prosecute uh, police and and also sue them in civil court. That's a huge evolution. She had not been for that before. And so I've seen her evolve. I still have criticisms. Um, I don't know that anybody was a bigger critic of Joe Biden than me, and I'm still not a fan. I, I don't think he's evolved in the ways that she has. And I, and I don't want to blame his age because I worked directly with Bernie Sanders for for years and saw Bernie grow and change and improve on issues like I had hard conversations with Bernie on issues of justice reform and saw him get better. So mm -hmm. Joe Biden can improve. But he's deeply resistant to change. Now, here's here's why I'm hopeful with his choice of Kamala, because I don't know that anybody that Joe Biden ran against punched him harder on issues than her. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she critiqued him hard on his authorship of the crime bill. Mm -hmm. She critiqued him hard on issues of integration and segregation. And they were some of the most damaging moments for Joe Biden in any of the debates. Mm -hmm. And that he still had courage enough to choose the single candidate who critiqued him the harshest, uh, I think that's an encouraging sign. Um, I think they can win. I think it's still, um, I think anybody who assumes that they're going to win, we've seen what happens when you do that. Uh, that's, that's a huge mistake. Um, I think over the next few months, both of them have a lot of work to do to, to connect with communities on issues and they need to campaign in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. That's challenging in some ways, but in other ways, the the pandemic allows them to kind of, this is gonna be a virtual campaign. Right. And um, I'm concerned in a lot of ways, but um, you know, I think there's some excitement there for her. I'll still be critical of her and her policies of Biden and his policies. I see that as part of my role as trying to hold mm -hmm. leaders and people in power accountable, particularly on issues of justice. Um, we're fighting really hard at our new organization, the Grassroots Law Project, for dozens of families who've experienced injustice. Uh, people can volunteer with us if they ever want to. Uh, we, have, we have staff members whose full-time job it is to manage our volunteers. They can go to grassrootslaw.org. They can Follow us on Instagram at Grassroots Law. Uh, we're doing great work at Real Justice. We have a, an election uh, next week in Florida. We're working to elect the new district attorney of Orlando. And uh, I'm doing an interview with her later today. Her name is Monique Worrell. 
a brilliant black woman who is a civil rights attorney herself. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the work that we're doing, but uh, this is a hard year. And uh, I think that 2020 will go down in history as one of the most difficult years in modern American history. It's a super difficult time. And um, I'm, I'm glad the book is out because my, my purpose for writing it is to give people action steps that they could take and be inspired by and, and put to work. So thank you all for having me on it means the world to be here. I, I enjoyed speaking with you all and, and uh, hope to do it again. Thank it you. truly was a pleasure and and I definitely uh, will make that happen. Um, yeah, thank you everybody all. is just absolutely loving all the content they're talking about. They done bought the book already. They're buying <laughs> it now. Um, so this is this has been amazing. I cannot, uh, you know, say anything other than, uh, you know, he, I feel like kind of capped this conversation beautifully. And so you all know, we do our best here uh, to talk about um, the leading top um, issues, questions, concerns that are facing blacks and brown, black and brown people here in America. And so um, here we try to ask the question, what's the message and find the hope in the headline. And so we can only do that um, with you. And so make sure that you are following us right here on Facebook at Message Magazine. Make sure that you are following us on Instagram and Twitter at Message1898. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our print magazine, our newsletter at www.messagemagazine.com. As always, it's a pleasure. As I promise, we'll be here every Thursday at 11 a.m. Same place, same time, just a whole new different topic. So uh, have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sean King. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. Claudia, I think the one other thing that we have to remember, our behavior is definitely influenced or impacted by, like, you know, I'm a seventh day. And we know that we decided that with the powers of Zoom and the like, uh, we can still, um, uh, the eating of certain animals. Headline, I am your host, Claudia Allen. This is my chief executive, right? Um, so many churches are actually 80% of the affiliates, ABC affiliates here in the United States picked it up. Not telling the truth and going back to let's just dip this water Some of up. The issues. And so we live our lives working. If you think about Brother most- Brother from another mother, the pastor, Richard Bird, Mark, and I'm telling you, you know, we handle the heavy stuff. We do the heavy stuff.